the likes of Ted Nugent was, was pretty much inconceivable circa 1978, 1979. I phoned up Barton a million times, old Jeff, and even he was like, well, I don't know, you know, and Jeff, I have got a serious music house here. The Bandwagon Heavy Metal Sound House is a heavy metal discotheque with a serious non-discotheque sound system that will blow you, all your allies and your office from here across the channel to France. It is populated by the greatest bunch of loonies you've ever seen. Please come down and give them your time. They are more than worthy of it. And it took forever and a day to get him there. And when he came, oh boy, that did it. We had a centre page double spread in next week's sounds. And that really did it. Oh boy, did that open the gates. All hell broke loose. That was it. They came from everywhere. And of course, once sounds did their opening piece on us, people started sending tapes to them as well. And they were snowed under too. And I used to talk to Jeff about, have you heard this, have you heard that? He used to say the same to me, what about this, what about that? And it was obvious that something was going on, wasn't it? And it was Al Lewis, the sub-editor of Sounds, who actually coined the phrase, the new wave of British heavy metal. It was kind of um, what we call in, in journalistic terms a stand first, underneath the review I did of um, Iron Maiden, Angel Witch and uh, Samson at the Music Machine. I think the main headline was, if you want blood and guts and gore or something, you've got it. And then um, the, the, the strap line underneath it said, the new wave of British heavy metal begins here or something, you know, by Jeff Barton. Sounds magazine, possibly because they had Jeff Barton there, and Jeff was a big hard rock, heavy rock fan, they picked up on it and they ran with the ball because it was an interesting, exciting time in music. Sounds had really jumped in with punk and got a lot of success and attention because of that as a weekly music magazine. And now they saw that there was another phenomenon happening. I feel the big difference is Sounds really not just championed these bands, but gave them a cause, gave them a focus by calling it the new wave of British heavy metal, calling it Nawabum. Inevitably it helped because um, people wanted to go and see bands um, that were the new wave of British heavy metal. Um, the name obviously suggested that um, there had been um, substantial rock acts before, but this was this was the next the next level, the next movement. Um, you know, the new kids on the block. Um, check them out, listen to them. Um, so it. it, it it helped all the bands that, that, were, that were encompassed within the new wave of British heavy metal tremendously, absolutely. We didn't put ourselves in the category, it, the journalists uh, uh, included us. So obviously when we're reading reviews and stuff like that, uh, we were saying to ourselves, hey, we're part of the new wave of British heavy metal. That's pretty good, isn't it? So we, we were obviously delighted to, to, to be included in that. You know, little did we know that, you know, we, we were, uh, from my mind, classed as, as one of the sort of the, the, the major runners in it. Now, with a movement to report on, rather than a selection of disparate bands, Sound struck up an enthusiastic relationship with Neil Kay's Soundhouse. The magazine even began to print a weekly rundown of the most popular records and demo tapes being played at the venue, which became a valuable resource for the fans and an essential point of exposure for the bands themselves. Printing the Soundhouse's most requested or most popular tracks on our charts page was a pretty big deal for Neil, actually, in retrospect. I mean, to be honest with you, the, the chart page was, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a bit of a nightmare to do anyway. And, and once you've got through the British Top 40 singles, which inevitably wouldn't include much rock or metal, and, and done the US singles or whatever else we did, we, we, you know, we used to have holes to fill. So I think when Neil offered us the chance of printing this chart with a great, you know, that's another little space that uh, that we can fill up there. But that proved to be immensely popular, and I think I think people people used to used to used to go to that in the manner of you know the way somebody would would go to MySpace today or whatever just to check out what the people at Soundhouse were listening to, what Neil Kay was playing, what demos he was playing, you know. That was great, that was great, that was a great scene. We had, did a three track demo, didn't we? It was like mm, three, three tracks. Some studios down in, in Kent, in Beckenham, and we just did three tracks and we took them to Neil at the Soundhouse and he played them and before we knew it, we had three of these tracks in, in the... His own little chart, and you know, yeah. it was amazing really for such a small little 
company, well, not a little, little, you know, little DJ um, outfit, and um, but for it to be published in Sounds magazine because it was nationwide, I think. So, um, and as Tuna said, I think we had, um, I think the three songs in the top ten, um, including number one. I think we had no, number one, number three, three and number yeah. seven or eight. I think yeah. it was, and it, it was incredible. So people, that rocked. <laughs> people then, it was really, I, I, you know, full credit to, to Neil. I think that really sets us going because. Um, to have three songs that people started saying, who is this praying mantis? So we did have record companies for the first time actually chasing us. We didn't need to go out, they were coming to us. And it was through this successful new demo tape culture that Neil Kay was exposed to the band who would become the movement's most iconic act. Having recorded a four track demo in December, 1978, Iron Maiden decided to introduce themselves to the Soundhouse scene. Suddenly one day into the wagon walked these two geezers, you see. Unassuming, quiet, one blonde, one with darkish hair. It was dark in the wagon. They came up to me on stage. They gave me a cassette. Didn't know who the hell they were, had no idea, just one of, I don't know, hundreds. The one with the dark hair said to me, do us a favour, mate, listen to our cassette, will you? And if you think it's any good, give us a shout and maybe a booking or something. I was so rude to the guy to this day. I hate myself for it. And I'm so very sorry. I swung round to him and said, oh yeah, you and Arthur Country, mate. When I'm ready, you'll hear from me. Give us a chance, all right. Of course, it was Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. I, I am so sorry. I took the tape home by 2.30 in the morning. I was jumping around and going utterly potty. I phoned Harry up, told him he was going to be an exceedingly successful young man, that what he had was undeniable. Maiden's timing was perfect, and the demo succeeded in establishing them within a scene that was about to explode. 1979 was to be a vital year for this new wave of British heavy metal, one which saw a number of bands raise their profile and begin to release records. The first off the block was Sheffield act Def Leppard, who set up their own label to distribute a three-track EP in February. The record ended up in the hands of DJ John Peel, who played it on his Radio 1 show and generated a lot of press for the young band. I first met Def Leppard when they came south to play the music machine for me. Prior to that, I'd had, I think it was a three track EP, like a vinyl EP that they had out at the time and probably a cassette tape as well. We didn't know much about them. I mean, we knew they were very young, but um, they were being handled by a local guy up there who had a record store. <clears throat> and uh, he, he sent me uh, a um, locally financed EP. At that time, they were not the Pyromania band, of course, that everyone latterly remembers with Mutt Langer, the producer at the helm. They were far more fiery, a lot more gutsy, and a lot more sort of Britishy, really. One of the most important things that happened really was the, the, the first one, I think, the one that came out the blocks first was Def Leppard's EP, followed by um, Iron Maiden's Soundhouse Tapes EP. Both self-pressed, both borrow the money, blag it off someone, get it in, get into a studio and record a song yourself and then sell it through gigs, sell it through mail order. This was something that really had come from punk. In days before punk, you grafted and grafted and grafted, you got a record deal, you got put in the studio, you spent a vast amount of money on recording time and drugs, and eventually you end up with an LP. Here you have people who are, let's face it, young, in the case of Def Leppard, very young, who scratched the money together, went into a studio, put their three best songs on tape, four in the case of Iron Maiden, um, and then pressed it themselves. For I believe Def Leppard spent about 148 quid or something like that, the whole thing cost them. We got three tracks on that EP that are very, very different. You've got the Rush-inspired epic of the Overture. You've got the kind of more Thin Lizzy-ish uh, Ride Into the Sun. And the out now, let's be metal, Get Your Rocks Off, which became sort of the anthem for, for their times. What it had in common with, with so many singles from both self-pressings and the independent labels to follow um, 